awesome. Happy Wildcats. That's Teddy Bruschi. <laughs> what a game he's had thus far. Hello, Teddy. Boy, he had Teddy Bruschi in his face. And again, who's there? Teddy Bruschi. Pressure, he's going down. First sack of the day belongs to Teddy Bruschi. Teddy Bruschi, number 68, leading the charge. What's up, Mom? What's up, Coach? I want to welcome Teddy Bruschi here, All-American, Super Bowl champ. <laughs> now you're inducted in the Pac-12 All-Century team. What was that yeah. honor like for you? It's a big word, All-Century. You know, it's not, it's not player of the year. It's not, uh, you know, all Pac-10 or Pac-12 or anything like that. I mean, you're talking 100 years. And so it's, it's really baffling to me, really, uh, truthfully, that uh, over a hundred, the course of 100 years of the history of this conference that, you know, I've been honored to be the, one of the defensive ends on it. And, I mean, to have so many great players on there, it's, it's, it's really baffling. I mean, it's an all-century team. I, w when does that ever happen? You know, it's just, it's, it's a huge honor for me. Read about the first time you tried out for football. You didn't have cleats on. <laughs> you know that story, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's the funniest thing, how I started to play football. I mean, I, I didn't start until I was 14 years old. So... I walk into freshman orientation at Roseville High School, and I see a couple friends of mine, Eric Denial, Jason Ramsey, I remember them still. I look to my right, and they wave me over, said, Teddy, come sit down, come sit down. And they said, we're gonna try out for the football team. You should come. And I said, okay. So I went, and the next day I went out there, and I had no idea what to do. I mean, Don Hicks was the freshman football coach at Roseville, Calif at Roseville High School in Roseville, California. I went out there with a Via tennis shoes. You remember those old shoes, AVIA, <laughs> so Via <old> tennis <laughs> shoes, no cleats, high tops though, thank goodness, and a, a t-shirt, a white t-shirt to put over my pads. That's all, I, I didn't even, I mean, I had played football in the backyard, tackling my brothers and friends and things like that, but organized football I knew nothing about. So I went out there just, totally as green as could be. And I mean, I remember him bringing everybody up and saying, okay, right here, you know, the sort of the pre-practice speech a coach gives, we're gonna work on this, you know, focus today, discipline, all that stuff. And then he says, okay, break up into all your positions. And I stood there and I said, where do you want me to go, coach? Where do you want me to go, coach? And he looked me up and down and he said, go with the linemen. And so those two events right there from playing football to being, you know, a defensive tackle slash defensive end and offensive guard at Roseville High, that started me on my football journey. I read that <laughs> your mom was like, I'm not going to buy you cleats yet. You know, so, I don't, I don't yeah, want you right. quitting here. You're right. You're right. So I, I went home after that and I told my mom, man, this is great. This is cool. I want to play football. And she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. 20 <laughs> second time. <laughs> and she says, I'm not, I said, I need, I need cleats. I'm, I'm slipping around out there. I'm not buying you cleats. Let's see how long you last. And so she lasted three days. So three days I lasted coming home. I love it. I love it. I love it. And then she took me to the store and bought me a high top. Pony seven stud cleats, white high tops, man, ponies. Fresh. And I remember that still, man. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just had this vision of you back then. Okay, you got your sweet cleats on now. Sure. But like you'd be the guy working out when nobody else was, when it was dark, when it was late. Did you always yeah. have this chip or did that develop and evolve through your high school career? Uh, I think it developed because I didn't play high school football with the goal to get a college scholarship. So my freshman year, I remember my dad coming out to watch me practice for the first time. He had driven up from San Francisco, where I was from originally, and he drove up and uh, saw me practice the first time, and he said, Ted, you got it. You got it, Ted, because he, of course, was a former coach. He, my dad used to tell me I could coach everything from fishing to football. Now, you're taking me down memory lane right here, okay? So after that day, he's like, you got it, Ted. Your body angle, the way you explode off the ball, those type of things, I can tell. And so... I always sort of wondered maybe how far I could go, you know, but I remember my junior year and I got a letter, my first recruiting letter. My coach gave it to me and I said, what's this? And he said, it's a recruiting letter. They may want to give you a college scholarship and it had a gold helmet in the upper left hand corner and it was UCLA. And I filled out that baby, I sent it back, and, and uh, then the letters started coming in. So I wanted to play in the Pac-10. It was the Pac-10 back then, of course, you know that. So Washington State and Arizona were the two schools that offered me visits. And those are the two, one, two I went to. But it really came down to, I mean, where did I want to spend the next four to five years of my life? And you know, the recruiting trips are in February during the winter and you go to Tucson, Arizona and the U of A mall and everyone's walking around there and everything's having a great time. 
And so I was like, yeah, I think this is where I'll stay for the next four years. When they're chanting your name, Bruce and that stadium is going like that, it, it had never done that before. You talk to people in that era, and all of a sudden, this football thing in Arizona started going. What was that yeah. like for you? After you make a play, you make a tackle, and all of a sudden, you'd hear 57,000 people chanting your name. I'd go look for my teammates to hug, <laughs> you know, because I always knew it was all of us doing something. Um, I know I don't know if I ever really heard it. I just I always just felt my teammates around me. Um, I mean, beating Washington the next year when they came back down. I think it was 1992 when they were ranked number one, and and we won in Tucson, and and everyone rushed the field. Malaulu, touchdown, Arizona. The Arizona Wildcats are on the verge of winning the biggest football game in their school's history. Now the crowd can have the field. Your final score, Arizona 16, Washington 3. That was really, I think, our breakout moment um, of that sort of arriving, beating a, a team that was quarterbacked by Mark Brunel and a lot of great players at the University of Washington to win that game. That was really when we set a statement and a tone for the rest of the Desert Swarm time there. So the accolades come, the clippings start to come, the pats on the back start to come. What's that like in, in Tucson? Because it's this small town, and all of a sudden, this defense, I know, whew, it caught right. fire. Yeah, Desert Swarm caught fire, really. And I remember, I mean, T-shirts and everything being sold, Desert Swarm on water bottles, everything, Desert Swarm everywhere. And, I mean, the players that we had, I mean, Rob Waldrop, I mean, he's on also on a member of the All-Century team. Uh, you know, Brant Boyer, Charlie Camp, Jim Hoffman, uh, Brandon Sanders, I mean, Ty Parton, so many guys were on that defense that were so, just so mad, mad at everything. You know, I think that's, I think that's the best way to describe all of us. Chris Lopez, those type of guys, always mad at something. Mad at being doubted in high school. Mad that somebody else was getting all the respect in the, in the, in the Pac-10 conference rather than us. Mad at offenses who thought that they could come and move the ball on us. I mean, we were so agitated all the time. And that's what really made us so good. I mean, it's, I mean, you can bleep it out, man. They call, we call each other the club. That's what we call this ourselves. You know, you got a gift certificate for being a certain guy on the field sometimes. We wanted you to be that type of guy on the field and ca cause that type of trouble. When you were getting stronger, were you thinking, all right, I'm gonna come back and, and one day my numbers are gonna be retired <laughs> at this university? Did you, ever, did you ever have dreams, or even if you didn't tell anybody, did you think that way ever? <laughs> never. I never, I just got done telling you, I didn't think, I didn't, I didn't even have the goal of getting a college scholarship. I mean, I always was, you know, short-term focus, what do I have right in front of me? What do I have to do next? That's all I ever focused on was what I was doing at that time. I never really considered myself a professional football player or that type of caliber until it was my redshirt sophomore year and I started to get accolades in terms of All-Americans and all Pac-10 mentions and things like that. But I was really a step-by-step -step type of guy, do the best you can right now and then, you know, let the chips fall where they may. I want to talk about your final sack in the regular season in the rivalry game against ASU. <laughs> no, and this is what they've got. They got trips, they got three receivers out there, and they Bruski got a hand on him. Bruski got a hand on him. Also in there was his running mate Osborne. Uh, is going to be credited as a half sack. It's a Bruski now has tied Derek Thomas's NCAA record for sacks. I'll never forget that game. Yeah, that's and that last sack. There's a story about that last sack, you see. I tied the all-time record for sacks with it, not because it was a half a sack, because who was on the sack with me was Chuck Osborne, one of our great defensive linemen. Now, if Chuck wasn't there, you see, it would have been a full sack, oh, and I would have gotten 52.5, and I would have got the record all by myself, you see. So that's a little bit of a story. Uh, Chucky, uh, he was so good, too, rushing the passer. We'd always say, I'll meet you at the quarterback, and we got there at the same time on, on Plummer. Yeah, it was Jake Plummer, and uh, 52 was the number, yeah. You're known a lot with your association with Coach Belichick. Right, right. What was your association like with Coach Tolman? Ah, 
Well, if, if Coach Belichick was the one that uh, took me to the next level in terms of teaching me how to be a champion and how to prepare and how to maintain a championship level of play, Coach Tomey really laid the foundation of myself as a man and a football player. And I think that's what really it should be in college athletic, athletics especially. Coach Tomey, I, I still talk to and, and text, and I, it's, it's, it's really a miracle that the old man can text. But yeah, he gets back to you pretty soon. So, I mean, anything that I need, he always tells me that he's always there for. I had talks with him in his office about, you know, changing myself to become better during my college career. I mean, I was a little bit of a hellion out there sometimes. I didn't know when to turn the switch off, when I'd go out and out in the campus and, and at nights with my friends and things like that. And Coach Tomey would bring me in and tell me, you're now you're starting to get into the next phase of your life where things are starting to be noticed a little bit more. This is now what I want from you. This is now what you're going to have to start to be. I had never really had anyone tell me that before. So that's what Coach Tomey was to me, really, the foundation for me becoming you know, a championship football player. Teddy Bruschi, number 68, leading the charge. Bruschi, the man with 16 sacks. He's a sack man. Draft day. One of my yeah. favorite parts of your book. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. What, what was that like for you? And did, did you, were you really just on the couch and just looking at the ticker and all of a sudden? Yeah, I got drafted by the bottom line at ESPN. <laughs> yeah, watching ESPN. I didn't get the, I didn't get the, I didn't get to go to New York or be that guy or anything like that, wear the nice blue suit or anything like that. But yeah, I'm walking by the TV. I mean, the first day had three rounds back then. So, I mean, everybody's tired. It was me, my stepfather, uh, Heidi, it was there. I mean, not, not a lot of people. So we just stopped. Uh, we just stopped watching for a little while. So I walk by the TV, and then all of a sudden, it starts flashing on the bottom of the screen, 86th pick, New England Patriots draft, Teddy Bruschi, and then it disappeared. And so I asked everybody, did anyone just see that? I think I just got drafted <laughs> by the Patriots. But the bottom line goes, then it goes one, two, three, four, all the way back oh, to 86, no. <laughs> so you're waiting. But I say it got to about 13 or 14, and then the phone rang, and then it was Bill Parcells. And then he told me that he was going to play me at linebacker and special teams and welcome to the New England Patriots. And then I hung up the phone in absolute disbelief, not only because I was now a member of a team on the NFL, but I had no idea whatsoever on how to play middle linebacker. I just didn't, you know, and that's the, they told me that that's, that's what they wanted me to play. And I was like, how am I going to do that? What do you do when, when you get that call and pumped, obviously, that you're drafted, but then also maybe scared, nervous, anxious about playing a position you hadn't? Yeah, you try to you try to just take everything in and you know when you get there, you do your work really. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, it's not like I'm going to turn it down or anything like that. I'm just going to try. And I mean, my first meeting with Al Groh, the linebacker coach, he says in cover 2 when you recognize pass, you drop to the hook. I said, "Where's the hook?" I really didn't know where it was. I just, all I did, I played defensive end at Arizona, jam seven, if the tight end's in front of you, you jam him into the <laughs> hole, right? And then if the tight end's not there, tackle. If the hip goes down, you shuffle, okay? If the hip is pass protection, boom, rush the passer. That's all I really knew. So I had to learn hook, flat, third, I mean, cover two, cover three, man to man, all of that stuff. I had to build a new foundation. What were those early years in the league like? You have Bill Parcells and you have Pete Carroll and then eventually you get to, to Bill Belichick. Yeah, um, I had to find a way to keep myself on the team, you know, as I learned to play linebacker. And I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a handful of guys, uh, I mean, that still have to realize that. I mean, when you're a, that tweener type of player and they don't know where they want you to be at, to buy yourself as much time as you possibly can while they figure out and well, while they figure out where to put you and how when you figure out how to play while you play special teams and you do what you do best, which is still rush the passer. So I mean I was playing defensive tackle uh, in sub packages at New England, my rookie year, defensive end, off the line rusher, and I was on every special teams. And I had to make sure I was productive making tackles on kickoff and punt team and, and blocking them up on kickoff and punt return and, and getting a few sacks in the process. Did, did you like it when it was hard? Well, I wondered. I wondered if I'd ever get it, really. I mean, because 
to have your hand down the ent your entire life, high school and college, and then be asked to step five to six yards off the ball, and now instead of seeing this, now you see this. And to see that big picture of all the way to tight ends, wide receivers, slot receivers, and motions, and all, and then you coming in here to a box of linemen, reading, blocking schemes, and all that stuff, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to get that. And I was very, that was, I was very nervous about that, yes. And how would you prepare to make sure you got it? What, what type of things would you do that nobody would have known or maybe the common athlete wouldn't do? I had to find my own way because I really don't feel I was a traditional linebacker in the NFL doing it traditional ways. We had a linebacker by the name of Ted Johnson that would just go right down the middle of everyone and buckle their knees because he was a great two-gapping Mike linebacker. Now I end up playing Mike. Now I gotta be smart enough to know I'm not as big as he is, I'm not as strong as he is, I gotta do things a little bit differently. So if I gotta faint and I gotta go back door and I still got, I gotta stack a guy or I gotta, I gotta do things just a little bit more slippery than that, I gotta find a way to do that and that was things I had to figure out for myself really. It seemed like the era under Bill Belichick, you always found a way. What made those teams and, and that community so unique as competitors? I think, it, I think what made it unique is that you never know where it was coming from. Other teams just didn't know if it was going to be myself or Willie McGinnis, you know, so who's going to make a big play. Is it Vrabel? Is it Pfeiffer? I mean, is it even Malloy in the back, Ty Law? Certain ways that we could win football games, we all had that ability in us to make the biggest plays at the most opportune times. And especially in 2001 when we win, I mean, we go into Pittsburgh and we end up blocking a field goal and Troy Brown ends up returning it for a touchdown and he also has a punt return for a touchdown. To win those type of ways late in the year after Thanksgiving and especially in the playoffs, that's what we knew how to do. Three Super Bowl championships. Yeah. What was the first one like for, for a kid from Roseville, right. California who never had, had never had cleats on? Yeah, it was really special. Um, I think whenever you play for a franchise and you're on the team that brings the first because the fan base, they really don't believe it can happen yet. I mean, a lot of New England, it was Red Sox based, it was Celtics based, and they really sort of just, okay, if it happens for the Patriots, it happens. But once you break through like that and you get fans coming up to you and saying, my grandfather says he can die now a happy man, and it's like, that's really the effect that you can have in a fan base like New England that really from generation to generation really follow their team passionately. You know high performers and to maintain a high level of performance is one of the hardest things to do. Your team did that, but you're credited a lot with setting the culture, guiding, leading potentially that culture. What did you do? All I did was really just be myself, you know, and, and even when, when you have success, you know, always just trying to deflect it as best you can and realize there's only one way you're going to get there and, and it's with other players. You know, it's Parcells had a great saying of, you know, expect nothing, blame no one, do something. You know, those type of football lessons that I had that transferred on to Pete Carroll teaching me my enthusiasm for the game and then Bill Belichick teaching me the ins and outs of technically defensive football and teaching the entire team on how to win. But to say that I started it all by myself, I think is incorrect. You know, Coach Belichick says, do your job. And there's also a couple other levels of that. He's also said lately about do your job well is implied. But if you're in that system long enough as players, it's something that even Bill Belichick doesn't even know, that only players know. So once you do your job and you do your job well, help someone else do theirs. And then that's when you go help him bring, bring him along somehow, some way, and then you get a championship team. in your book written by Tom Brady and so many people look at him and revere him for obvious reasons but he talked about how he followed you what was that like to 
usher him into being the voice, the face, the leader that everybody knows him to be. Yeah, I remember, I remember Tom as a rookie, you know, and making bets with him about intercepting him at practice. And <laughs> I bet you 20 bucks, I get one from you today. And, you know, I'd go out and get one from him and there'd be 20 bucks in my locker. You know, he always paid his debts. <laughs> but, you know, it's flattering, you know, but players always have to take it to the next level themselves because you can only tell a player so much. Like, I only gave Tom, I mean, he, he said he, he followed me and he watched me, but I was watching him in the same way. You know, I saw him develop. And to think that I couldn't have learned from him also, just because he was younger than me, that's when you get caught up in yourself. Like, I've been here four years. This is only your second. You got to listen to me. That's not the way it should be. Wait, I see this young second year player that's also doing well himself, so what can I learn from that? And to have that type of outside of the box type of thinking that goes along with humility, I think it's hard for athletes to have sometimes. When the game was almost taken away, what, what was that experience like for you when you go through mm. your stroke and you go down that process of, well, what, I, what I've come to fall in love with might not be here anymore? Stroke back then for me in 2005 was for grandmas and grandpas, man. I had no idea that it was something that could happen to a 31-year-old professional athlete or someone younger from since, from since I, that I've learned from being with uh, the American Stroke Association and learning of the awareness of stroke. But it's really shocking and I really didn't, I don't even, I didn't even know if I wanted to come back and play because I just didn't, didn't even know it was possible because the one goal that I had, I just wanted to get back to being a father and a husband again. I mean, I couldn't see in the left field of both my eyes I mean, I had a hole in my heart that I, had need, I needed a, a patch to be surgically implanted into my heart. How am I going to play football again? It's not even possible. That's the thought process that I went through my mind. So it was really hard for me when I went in to Coach Belichick's office and I told him I'm going to retire. And you know, I just, at that point, that, that drive home after that meeting with him, I mean, you, you, you take the same route home that you took every day after practice, you know, or after every game down Route 1 in Foxborough, Massachusetts, all the way to North Attleboro, and you see the same stores and the same route, but it's just different. And you know it's always going to be different because it's over. And that's where I was at that point. We all struggle when, when our time ends with the game. Right. You know, and, and you thought your time was going to end with the game, but you took the next step forward, man. And, and to me, that's... That's to fascinating. Play. Yeah. To play. I knew I had to give it a shot. You know, once, once my vision started to come back, because that was the one thing that I knew that, I mean, if I can't see over here, I'll get blindsided. There, there's no way they're going to let me on the field. But once that came back, that's when the thoughts started to creep in my mind about, you know, maybe I can do this again. Now, the biggest problem was convincing my wife, <laughs> Heidi, to, to let me play again because... I mean, if any, any woman would understand, I mean, you're the father of my kids. I mean, you're my husband. I don't want you going back out there. I mean, you got a device in your heart. You just had a stroke. You got scars on your brain. What are you doing? Are you stupid? So we had these conversations. We almost approached it like a game plan to a football game, getting as much information as we possibly could, see as many doctors as we possibly could. And then when they convinced us both that, you know, if I felt, if we felt it was possible to do, you should give it a shot. So I knew that knowing that now, five years down the road, if I didn't, it'd eat me up and I'd never get this chance again. So that's when Heidi and I decided to attempt the comeback. What has this game done for you outside of the rings and the trophies and the parades? I mean, football teaches you life, really. I mean, it, it, it tests you in ways you can't be tested in the real world. I mean, it's... It's so real, you have so many moments of truth in football games where there's a middle linebacker and there's a, and the fullback and you come into the hole and that's your moment of truth. You can't get your way out of it. It's only what are you gonna do at that moment to win against another man? You know, in that type of conflict, that type of adversity, the lessons you go through to get to that point, to train yourself as best you possibly can, to get to that one moment where you're in that hole and you know you've done all your, all your work and it's me and it's you. And what's it gonna be? And you still go forward. It teaches you courage. It teaches you how to handle every 
adverse situation that you will have in your life outside of the field. It teaches you how to come back from a stroke. It teaches you how to have a good marriage. Those type of things, all of that, I credit Don Hicks, Dick Tomey, Pete Carroll, Bill Parcells, Bill Belichick, everything that I've learned. Because if you're smart enough, and you have a, and if you're fortunate enough to have a long enough career, and you're lucky enough to play for great coaches and have great teammates, and you're smart enough to learn the lessons and take them with you, and then apply them not just to sports, but to your life, then you become a winner. When it's over, it's one of the hardest things to deal with. As a college athlete, there's way more college athletes than NFL athletes who are told the game's over for them. What do you hope that collegiate athletes who don't get to go play at the next level, what do you hope that they take from this game and how do you think they can apply it to life after the game? That's a good question because I was very fortunate to go on and play in the NFL and then after the NFL, I was very fortunate to get a call from ESPN to still stay in the game and cover it and talk about it. So when that court is cut, that's why I say to stay in that moment while you're in college because the experience isn't just football, the experience is also the education. I graduated before I left, all right? So I knew I had a diploma, I had a college ed education, if it didn't work out, if this defensive lineman wasn't able to learn the hook drop, okay, and become a middle linebacker, I knew what I was going to do, at least, well, did I know? No, but did I have the degree to fall back on? Yes. So that, first of all, make sure you have that college degree, because that's your fallback plan. But it's hard to say goodbye, because football's so special.